welcome back everyone um, so we'll continue uh, talking about calculus on manifolds today and just to remind you what we did last time we defined vector fields so vectors and vector fields so let's just say vector at a point um uh, just um, takes a function um takes a function to um so x capital x takes a function to x f where we can describe x in two ways in the abstract way we say that x on the product fg is equal to x f times g plus f times xg this is not the composition of functions it's a product of two functions hmm, on a manifold uh, this is the abstract definition and in coordinates x is just the same as ai del by del xi so it's the gradient operator uh, with any linear combination we like and whatever linear combination we pick will make it the gradient or directional derivative along some curve in the manifold so this is vector at a point and vector field just extends extends the concept in a differentiable way over the whole manifold so in that case for example if x is a vector field we don't use a different notation then x sends f to xf not just at a point but all over the manifold and this new function is again c infinity if f was c infinity so that's vector field so we discussed it quite a lot last time and uh, there are just one or two things i need sorry about the noise this construction work going on at home construction work going on in office so pretty much anywhere i sit this problem is there okay so a few extensions uh, since we defined a vector field let's as well define a tensor field and uh, the abstract definition is very appealing uh, we simply say that take a collection of functions of functions f1 up to fn where n is any arbitrary integer so each one of these is a function from the manifold to the real numbers so the manifold is m this is my differential manifold here is x the real numbers and so f1 does this f2 is another function f3 is another function like that just lots of functions but i just put them into a kind of a uh, n component vector okay now uh, an nth uh, a tensor field of rank n is a map x from this collection of functions to x of the collection of functions satisfying so we don't say what the map is we only say what properties it has if x acts on a collection of functions times another collection where this times is like multiplication component wise so let me separately in a box here right that f1 up to fn times g1 up to gn is f1 times g1 comma dot 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 fn times g this is just all multiplication of functions but the function the f1 and g1 and h1 any other function with label 1 is just multiplied with each other and put back this is not any familiar vector multiplication this is the one that we need for this discussion and the rule is that this acts in the uh, way that a uh, in the distributive way that we expect of derivatives namely this is x of f1 up to fn the new function start with g1 up to gn plus the old 
set of functions f1 up to fn start with x on g1. So it has this derivative or distributive type of property like derivatives. Now, just as the original one was abstract, but it had a simple form in concrete uh, terms. So the original one was uh, uh, this such, that, yeah, sorry, I've written it here with this property. Um, and then we could get a concrete form like this one uh, by going to a coordinate system. So here also we can get a concrete form of an X which does that. So in a coordinate system, X can be written as, so the idea is that the basis, earlier it was del by del, del Xi, it was a gradient. Now there's del by del Xi1 cross this is like a direct product. So these are like completely independent spaces, del by del x i n. But now multiplying it, I have a i1 i2 dot 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 i n of x. Okay, maybe I should use small a because that's what I used last time for the component of a vector. It just, general, just generalizes it to a, 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 a n component object where the indices n uh, i1 up to i n are all upstairs. And it's very easy to find the transformation law. I'll leave it for you as an exercise. Uh, the transformation law for gradient is well known. It's just chain rule is known. So requiring the object itself x to be coordinate independent gives us the rule, the law for a i1 up to i n of x. And might as well not make a big secret of it. I think it's not written in my, for some reason I didn't write out some formula explicitly in the book, but let's write it here. So if I go from x to another coordinate system x prime i, then a i1 up to i n goes to a prime i1 up to i n uh, defined as, so this is of x prime, defined as a prime i1 up to i n of x prime. Uh, so those who are new, I, most of you have seen this, but those who are new, let me just give you my trick for writing the answer. I can never remember which side I should put the prime. So I don't put it at first. I write this, then I write a j1. Of course, these indices have to be named differently and it's going to be a j1 up to jn of x. That's what has to happen because it's a transformation, linear transformation among the components of a. And now uh, something has to be contracted with J1 up to Jn and that has to be here down because the upper index of X, um, X always has an upper index always and therefore del by del X has a lower index. So this is well contracted. Therefore these are I1 up to In and now we simply realize that these must be the X primes. I'm just giving you a way to remember how it's done. Uh, this is the precise transformation law. And if you check uh, when n is one, we get back the transformation law of components of a vector field. So these can be called components of the tensor. While capital X is the tensor itself. As you see, the components have all the indices, but capital X blissfully has no indices. It's just defined in the way uh, over here as a uh, linear map from uh, from uh, an n-tuple of functions uh, to another n-tuple of functions. Okay, and, and this is how the components transform. And in physics, this is called a contravariant tensor. Uh, now, phys physicists did not invent notation like uh, words like this on their own. I think they come from old mathematics textbooks. So in old mathematics textbooks, this was used. Uh, but in modern mathematics, uh, contravariant tensor will be replaced by components of a vector field. Okay, so it's the same as 
components, maths. Now, there may be a more sophisticated way, but I think components of a, um, of a tensor field. Okay, where tensor field is X, it's uh, defined by that differentiation property. So far, so good. Okay, good. Now, an interesting property uh, of this, uh, oh, by the way, it's an exercise. You have to check that this kind of thing I've written here, when you act on a collection of N functions, really does satisfy this distributive law. Okay, so please sit and do it. Um, good. Now, an interesting thing is, uh, suppose we have two manifolds. So all this was defined on one manifold. But the nice thing is that if we have two manifolds, then the vector fields on one are related in a certain way to vector fields on another if we have a map between them. So two manifolds, uh, M, N with a map uh, phi, M to N. Now, uh, I'm sorry, but I often use phi to be a homeomorphism, but just now it's just a map. It's not, well, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not a homeomorphism um, or a diffeomorphism, but it's a C infinity map. So what's the difference from a homeomorphism or diffeomorphism? Well, homeomorphism should be one-to-one -one and on-to and then continuous in both directions, okay? Diffeomorphism is that plus differentiable, both F and F, in, uh, phi and phi inverse. But here, we are not claiming that it's one-to-one -one and on-to in the first place. So not necessarily one-to-one, on-to. Therefore, um, there's no question that you can ask about the inverse map. The inverse map is not defined on points. So you can't ask those questions, but in the forward direction, it should be continuous and even differentiable. So that is a C infinity map. So here's M and here's N. And here's my phi. Now, supposing I have a function, last time, remember, we motivated vector fields uh, by talking about functions from a manifold to a uh, to, to, real, to real numbers. We could take complex numbers also. It wouldn't change this discussion. So let's assume there's also a function f from n to r. Okay. Now notice that this uh, map, C infinity map from m to n followed by a function from uh, n to r gives me a function from m directly to r, which is nothing but f composed with phi. Okay, so f composed with phi if is just the function which will take me from points of m to r. Okay, now because of this setup, if I define a vector field uh, on m, then I get a vector field on n uh, essentially through this map phi. So let's state that. Uh, in fact, I get a map from the, okay, I forgot to uh, repeat one thing from last time these um, uh, vector fields at a vectors at a point form the tangent space T, P, M. Uh, so the linear span of vectors of all X at P is called the T, is called T, P of M is the tangent space to the manifold at point P. So what I want to claim now is that phi from M to N, which is just a map pointwise from points of M to uh, points of N, induces a map that is called phi lower star, and lower is important, from the tangent space on M to the tangent space. Uh, so tangent space on M at a point P, right? Now, here we claim it uh, takes it to a tangent space uh, on the manifold N, but at what point? Obviously, since phi is uh, given to us, it will be the image of that point P. So phi of P. So phi star is a map from TP of M, tangent space uh, at point P on M, uh, to the tangent space at the image point phi of P uh, on N. But I haven't told you what the map is, uh, but the map is pretty easy. Phi star should take an X, which belongs to this, uh, to phi star of x, right? And uh, by uh, the definition says that phi star of x is that vector field on n which acts on functions f 
uh, by the following pro process. Instead of taking phi, so I'm defining phi star of x on an arbitrary function f. I'll define it by saying take f composed with phi. This is now a function on m on the first manifold, this one, on this one, and act with x. Okay, so this is a beautiful equation. Uh, this tells me the action of a vector field phi star x, which is in tangent space to the manifold n at the point phi of p. It says phi star x is defined by having the following action on functions f on n. Whenever phi star x acts on f, I, I, I give you the answer that is the action of x on f composed with phi, which you can call the pullback of x, if you like, onto m. And we, we showed already, or we argued in drawing this figure, that if there's an f which takes you from n to r, then there's, an, and if there's also a phi which takes you from m to n, then of course there is an f composed with phi, this one. So we use this to define the, um, the um, vector field phi star x. So phi lower star takes you from tpm to t phi p of n such that x goes to phi lower star of x. This is quite a useful relation. Uh, it's quite a deep relation because it sets up an equality between two vector spaces, the tangent space of one manifold and the tangent space of another. And what it requires is a, a C infinity map from one to the other. And remember that it takes you in the forward direction. That means if you have the tangent space at M, then it will give you an element of the tangent space at the image point in N. It doesn't work in the other direction because we haven't given phi any extra properties. Phi doesn't even act in the other direction. Soon we'll see that other spaces, not tangent spaces, but other kinds of spaces map in the reverse direction. And that's also important. We'll come to that. Okay, so that concludes for now my study of vector fields. Although actually, uh, I think I should uh, not stop this. I should uh, uh, define one very important quantity is defined later in the book, but now I'll define it uh, for you right away. Supposing uh, X and Y are two vector fields on M. So now I'm back to the situation where I have only one manifold. Now X, Y, uh, so and, and uh, suppose that and f is a function from m now to r, okay? Then x, y, f is defined because it is, it says first take, if f is a function, then y, f is a function. Is the function obtained by acting with y on f. Now, if y, f is a function, then I can act with x on that and I get another function, okay? Now, let's try to do it in the reverse way. This is y on x, f. Now, the way in which we do it makes it pretty clear that these two things don't have to be the same. And so we'll define uh, X commutator Y uh, as the vector field whose action on a function F from M to R is X, Y, commutator on F is X times Y times F minus Y times X times F. Okay, so this is a commutator of two vector fields and it's uh, not only called the commutator, it's called the Lie bracket. And in fact, this defines a Lie algebra. We'll not explore that Lie algebra aspect of it, but this is called the Lie bracket or simply commutator. Both are equivalent. Now, all this looks very nice in the abstract. Even the abstract definition uh, can be used to show that in general, uh, x, y doesn't uh, commute, x, y and y, x are not the same. So x comma y is not zero. It might sometimes be zero, but in general, it's not zero. Uh, you can see that if you act it on a product f times g and use that distributive property, but there's another way to see it, which is in coordinates. So, as physicists, we always understand everything better in terms of coordinates. The only thing is we always have to struggle to realize that even though there are coordinates, 
the basic result doesn't actually depend on the coordinates. Only us calculating it depends on the coordinates. Okay, it, there's a rule to transport that result to any other coordinates. Okay, but supposing I have some coordinates, then x will be nothing but a i of x d by dx i, and y will be some other b i of x d by dx i. So now x y f is equal to a i d by dx i b j. Now I'll change the dummy index to because they're summed independently d f by dx j. And this has two terms. So this is a i d b j by dx i d f by dx j uh, plus a i b j t by dx i dx j of f. Okay. And y x f by just looking at this and interchanging a's and b's, I'll get b uh, i del a j del x i del f del x j plus, okay, that probably was not the best way to write it. Um, let's keep the indices as they were before. So b j del a i, this is j. These are dummy indices, so it actually doesn't matter. But here I get b j a i del 2 f del x i j del x i. Okay, now if I take the difference and sum up this thing, then these two cancel by the fact that the derivative uh, in uh, two different ordinary derivative in two different orders commutes. And so eventually I find that x y minus y x f is equal to this difference. And for this difference, I can uh, probably again relabel, maybe the, my original relabeling was cleverer. Uh, this minus b i del a j by del x i uh, del f by del x j. You can just do this calculation yourself. It's very elementary. And from this, we learn that x comma y is equal to c j del by del x j, where c j of x is this combination a i uh, del by del x i b j minus b i del by del x i a j. Some all, all repeated in this is summed. So this is how the Lie bracket works. The components of the Lie bracket are this combination of components of the original vector fields. Okay, good. This is very simple, but it's useful. Uh, and it also has a geometric meaning. Uh, if you remember, these vector fields were supposed to generate some kind of motion on this differentiable manifold along some curve. They might come from a particular curve or they might be used to reconstruct a particular curve, but either way, they generate some kind of mo motion on the manifold. So if I have X and Y, that's two different vector fields. One will generate a motion along one curve, the other along another curve. So the commutator is basically saying, let me translate a little bit along one curve and then the other, or let me translate first along the other and then the, the one, and let me compare the result, okay? So I, I basically move in two independent directions, once this way and that way, once this way and that way, and the difference of those two, if any, will give me the, um, the Lie bracket. And the reason it's non-trivial is that generically, there is a difference between these two ways of doing things. And that difference is captured by the Lie bracket. Okay, good. Now, uh, quickly take questions and move on to the next thing, which is also fairly large. Uh, by reverse, you mean inverse? I don't know. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't even remember when I said reverse, okay. Can Poisson brackets be related? Yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, actually, the yeah, Poisson bracket is sort of something to like vector fields or involve vector fields because so they are really uh, dot products of vector fields on the symplectic manifold using a symplectic form. So, you know, Dhruv, I'm not going to go into that here, but yeah, of course, they, they, they do have uh, certain properties in common. Okay, good. 
Okay, so now let's move on and let's talk about differential forms. So these two things, vector fields and differential forms, uh, are the basic uh, things, uh, ingredients of calculus on manifolds. Both of them can be sort of extended to some kind of tensor, but we'll first talk about the simplest case <coughs> and then go to the general case. Now, there are many ways to introduce differential forms, uh, but I'm going to, so uh, I thought about what would be the best way to do it. Um, one way uh, to do it, uh, well, I think the best way to do it is, is the mathematician's way to define it. Okay, so, so first we'll define uh, the concept of dual vector space. for any vector space V. So at this moment, I'll ask you to forget that we are on a differentiable manifold. We've studied topology, et cetera, et cetera. We just have any vector space whatsoever, but let's take it to be a finite dimensional vector space V and uh, let it have a basis. I mean, every vector space has a basis. So let the basis be called EI with I equals one to N. I remind you that a vector space has is a collection of abstract quantities called vectors. You're not allowed to multiply vectors. You're only allowed to add uh, and subtract vectors. Zero is a vector. Linear combinations of vectors are vectors. And the vector space has a dimension n, which I, which I call n here. And that means they're exactly n linearly independent vectors in that space. And all others are linear combinations of those. So for example, if a is a vector in V, then A must be equal to A I E I. And uh, again, I'm just using the summation convention. I is a summed over. Good. Now, uh, so I didn't yet define dual vector space. Let's just say this is for any vector space. So consider any vector space. Any vector space with basis like this. Okay. Then definition the dual vector space um, called V upper star. So these stars uh, appear up or down according to mathematics conventions and we must respect those, okay? Is defined, it is the vector space generated by a dual basis with respect to an inner product. So the dual basis has a, is called E upper star upper I. So E lower I without a star are the basis vectors of V then the basis vectors of the dual of V up uh, star, the dual to V is, e, is called E upper star I. And the property is that E upper star I comma E J lower is equal to delta I J. Now this is highly abstract and it almost tells you nothing. Because after all, we didn't say what is the inner product. And the reason is that we are just defining a new space and saying that there is an inner product such that the new space is related to the old space in this way. In some sense, every n-dimensional vector space is the same, okay, in, in the abstract sense. It has, n, uh, it has a basis of n vectors EI, and then all other vectors are written as summation AI EI. So we are saying there's a new one. Uh, for the new one, we call it V star, we call the basis E star, and then we introduce a pairing which says that once you have chosen your basis uh, E uh, and your basis E star, then there's an inner product which relates them in this way. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between each E and each E star, namely E1 uh, with E star one is the inner product is one and E1 with E star two, three, four up to N is zero. Just as simple as that. Okay, now, this is not very exciting. This is just a definition, but now something, yeah, okay. So now uh, let's just say one more thing and then get apply this to 
uh, tangent space. Okay, if we were studying vector spaces, this would become exciting because we would talk about theorems involving dual spaces. But right now at this uh, stage, uh, we just note the following. Uh, let's now look at an arbitrary A in V and an arbitrary A prime in V star. They're not related to each other. Mm. But then because of this inner product, this bracket, uh, we have a map. The map is called that. Okay, it's just written as the inner product with two empty slots. And it takes A and A prime together to R. And how does it act? Basically, it takes it to the inner product of A and A prime and A, which is a real number. And what is this real number? Well, uh, we can easily find it out because if A is uh, a vector in V, then it can be expanded over the basis like this. A prime is a vector in V star, so it can be expanded in a basis like that. Okay, so now uh, A prime with A is equal to uh, A I, uh, sorry, A prime I E star I comma A J E J. Uh, oops, did I mess up everything? Possibly. Yes, I did mess up everything. Wow. Oh, yeah, almost impossible to mess up more than I just did. Okay, uh, this is this. Then <clears throat> this is primed, and this is this, this is here, and wow, how much trouble one can create in a few seconds. It should be obvious to you what I should be writing. I'm sure you are all sitting there saying, oh God. Okay, so this I think now is correct. And this in turn, AI, prime and aj are just numbers they're numerical components of the vector so they don't participate in this inner product and then the inner product that's left is e i e star i e j but we already know that that's here and that's the whole point of the uh, dual basis so that's a a prime i a upper j delta i j and now since all indices are summed over that's a prime i ai okay so very nice thing is that if I define a dual space uh, <clears throat> of a vector space, then um, if I define it using the basis, just define the basis first, namely in this way, then that gives me obviously the inner product between any vector in the original space and in the dual space purely in terms of their components. And now we can apply this to, um, we can apply this to, to uh, the tangent space to find its dual. Now this may look a little abstract to you right now, but I promise you that in about five minutes, it'll look quite concrete. Okay, uh, before we do that, just uh, a parenthesis, and if you find the terminology too cumbersome, don't worry, but mathematicians often refer to the dual of a space dual of V as space of linear functionals on V. You may come across this notation. What does that mean? Well, uh, this is inverted commas. This is not on uh, this thing on V. Nothing to do with V. Space of linear functions on V. So what is a linear functional? A linear functional is something which takes a vector to a real number. Okay, so linear functional uh, takes a vector to a real number and um, it takes, uh, for example, a element of V uh, will go to something then, okay, maybe I don't have notation for it. Let's, okay, let's, let's, uh, Let's exemplify it by in this particular case, and then you'll, you'll see what it is. So uh, the linear functional is, is the following. Uh, A prime in the dual space is defined by 
a not by saying that a prime is uh, expanded over a dual is expanded over a dual basis but that the map a prime and blank a prime comma blank is a map which sends a in v to a prime comma a in r so this is what it means a linear functional is just a linear map from the vector space v to the real numbers and it has the property that uh, lambda a plus mu b which is a arbitrary linear combination of a and b which are both in v goes to uh, lambda a prime a plus mu a prime b this is the linear aspect of that functional okay if you didn't like this it's fine but this is just to demystify a certain notation mathematicians use saying that the the dual uh, vector space has elements a prime uh, whose action on the original vector space is to dot into them and make real numbers that's basically what this is saying okay good so now uh, and the last ha huh, there's a last uh, amusing fact about vector so about dual spaces so property uh, fact about dual spaces uh, and we'll use all of these uh, for the tangent space in a few seconds so if we have a map uh, if we are given a map this one is pretty obvious and it's also quite useful f from one vector space to another so v and w are two vector spaces and we are given a map from the first to the second this induces a map f upper star from the dual of w to the dual of v so in the backward direction for the dual space okay now uh, i have to define the map for you and the rule is whenever somebody says you have a map it means that i should have a rule which tells me given an element in w star how do i get a element in v star okay and the answer is the following that if b prime is an arbitrary element in w star then f star of b prime supposing i can show that this is an element of v star then i'm done and if it's an element of v star it should act on vectors in v so acts on vectors in v vectors a let's say in v by uh f star of b prime comma blank takes uh a to f star b prime comma a which is by definition the same as b prime comma f of a so uh, you have to follow this uh, through a little bit yourself but basically what it says is that if i am given an element of the dual vector space of the second vector space w namely w star then um, f star uh, gives me an element of the dual to the original space v okay if there's a function f from v to w then f star takes the uh, dual space of w star back to v star and the rule is that f star acts on uh, those elements of v star by first taking uh, those uh, two by okay not sorry i'm tying myself up with words uh, it's it's this equation f star acts on an element of v star uh, by i should have said f star of b uh, f wow well, um let me say it let me stop and uh, take a breath and say it again um if i am given an element of the dual space to w then this element is in the dual space to v therefore it should act on a vector in v and take it to a real number how do i find that real number i first take that vector in v to w using this map and then i act with the given element of w star i'm really sorry for getting tied up but i hope uh, i hope it makes you feel better in case you were thinking this stuff is a little confusing it is confusing okay but this equation is crystal clear it basically tells me that when i have a function from one vector space to the next then i have 
another uh, that defines me a function from the dual of the second vector space to the first is probably actually easier than anything i've said okay good now we are going to use all those things uh, now uh, and come back to our favorite vector space t p of m tan the tangent space at m uh, at a point p in m okay so the dual okay first let's rem remind ourselves what was the basis the basis for this uh what plays the role was just the vectors d by d dx i in coordinates okay so in coordinates i have a basis and any linear combination of these gives me an element of tp of m okay now the dual space to tp of m is denoted not very surprisingly tp star of m and it has a name it's called the cotangent space this was called the tangent space okay and that's that in a way because i know i have the vector space tp of m it's the tangent space so the dual is defined since the first thing tp of m was a n dimensional vector space where n is the dimension of the manifold now so it has a dual which is the same dimension and all i have to do is define a dual basis and an inner product now of course uh, a slightly confusing thing uh, for physicists is that the basis of this cotangent space is denoted dxi now physicists looking at dxi will um, think that this is an infinitesimal but this is just notation however it's also not just notation it's also motivation it turns out that this quantity dxi which i define as the dual basis uh, transforms under change of coordinates just like an infinitesimal coordinate distance okay so first let's uh, define note the defining property of this basis namely there's an abstract inner product such that dxi comma d by del by del xj is delta ij because this was the e and this was the e star hmm? basis of this vector space basis of the dual space and between them we are supposed to have a delta an inner product which returns delta ij so that's just notation however if you see the right side of this is completely coordinate independent okay so it must be we must have for two coordinate systems which are let's say different in principle for two coordinate systems xi and yi we should have both of them are just different coordinate systems for the same vector space so last time i spent a lot of time you might have felt i am trying to sort of overkill but i spent a lot of time explaining that this concept of vector field or vector or tangent space doesn't really depend on coordinates okay it really uh, is a is a, is a motion on the manifold along any path of your choosing and that motion is defined independent of the coordinates you use to describe it so it should be the case that dyi del by del yj is equal to delta ij also where yi is equal to yi of x now let's try to see how we can justify this fact that this is true but this is also true in a different coordinate system then it's true in all coordinate systems okay for that we need to set up a relation between del by del y and del by del x as well as between dy and dx okay now it's easy to see that if y is yi of x then dyi so now i'm going to use the infinitesimal so infinitesimal dyi in as physicists understand it is del yi del xj dxj okay this is just how this is a function of a function right okay but now you can think of this and this as abstract objects and say that well the transformation is the same this way 
So the abstract objects have upper indices and the transformation is by exactly this factor. Okay, so that's why dy or dx are called what they are called. They're called that way to suggest infinitesimal, uh, but they really don't mean infinitesimal. They mean something much more uh, subtle than that. They mean something also much more abstract than that. Okay, basically they mean a basis which transforms in co a given coordinate system the way I've written. Now, how does del by del yi transform? Well, again, this is chain rule. So del by del yi is nothing but del xj by del yi, del by del xj. Okay. So for this, I invert the uh, function y of x into x of y, and then I use chain rule and I get this. And you can see that these are somehow related but opposite ways of transforming. This is the way objects with upper index transform for physicists. And the lower one is the way objects with lower index transform. So del by del xi is an object with lower index transform. And you see that in one case, y is upstairs, x is downstairs. In the other case, x is upstairs and y is downstairs. And now it's an easy exercise to show that uh, this immediately implies that the abstract inner product dyi del by del yj is equal to dxi del by del xj is equal to delta ij. And what you have to do for this is take this one, plug in these two things, then use this one. And you'll see that these two factors basically cancel each other out. And so if this was normalized to delta ij, this is also normalized to delta ij. And that's all you want. Okay. So this shows that the dual space is well defined and uh, the dual basis is defined in any coordinate system, but it's not the same across coordinate systems. For vector fields, the basis transforms this way and for different for uh, the dual basis, it transforms this way. But we haven't given a name to the dual basis yet. So all we've concluded now is that the dual basis is called dxi in a coordinate system. So an arbitrary uh, vector in the dual space uh, will be a, uh, well, a prime, we were saying for the dual vector space is equal to, well, I, I don't want to put, use the prime right now. Let me do something. Let me use a completely different notation. So an arbitrary vector omega in V star in the dual space has to be expandable as omega i dx i, because whenever you have a basis, an arbitrary vector is a linear combination of that basis. Okay. And this quantity is called a one form. So the dual to a vector field is a one form. That's the one line summary. Okay, why it's called a one form may become clearer, but anyway, it's again just notation. Uh, note that at this stage, omega i are just some constant numbers, they're not functions. So this is a one form based at a point p. Okay, so I have, uh, sorry, so I, actually I haven't said this, uh, dual to a vector um, at p is a one form. But now I can easily extend this. So let me remind you vector at p was just a i for some constants del by del x i and one form is omega i dx i that's it now notice that because these belong to dual spaces at the point p uh, i can take the inner product uh, of the one form with the vector but i have to put the one form on the left that's in the dual space i have to put the vector on the right that's in the original space Hmm. The inner product is not something symmetric. It has a right slot for the vector space and a left slot for the dual. So now if I call this A and I call this omega, then I have the inner product omega with A is omega i dx i comma A upper i del by j del by del x j. Now again, omega i and a j come outside because they're just numbers dx i with del by del x j by definition is the abstract inner product delta i j and uh, oh, I messed up again. Wow.
omega i a j delta i j and this is omega i a i where have i seen this before well just a few minutes back i said that we can define an inner product between any element of a vector space and its dual and this is a particular vector space the tangent space and uh, omega is living in the dual or cotangent space and the inner product is uh, this product between their components and it should be an easy exercise to check that even though uh, these descriptions are coordinate dependent but this is coordinate in invariant that means the value of omega i ai will be the same in all coordinate bases okay so omega i ai in the x system will be the same as omega prime i a prime i in the y system okay and that's captured by this notation you see that in this notation we've just used the abstract element of the tangent space and cotangent space with no mention of coordinate systems so it better be that this inner product this one has a meaning independent of any coordinate system and indeed it is so okay you can see from this these two steps that if i was doing this in the y basis then this and this would anyway cancel each other to give delta ij that's true in all bases we just saw it and so you would always get this dot product so before i take questions just one last comment which is really important uh, two last comments uh, one is that uh, right now we so a, a vector space in general may or may not have an inner product and right now we don't have any inner product on the tangent space so i cannot take two tangent vectors and take any inner product or dot product on them hmm? in physics we are used to the idea that any vector any kind of vector we can always take a product but we don't have a metric we are working with differentiable manifolds and as long as we do that we can only do what we are allowed to do in differentiable manifolds without a metric so there's no inner product on the tangent space there's no inner product on the cotangent space there's only an inner product between an element of the cotangent space and an element of the tangent space because these are dual spaces to each other okay very very important so don't forget that in this bracket which you see here don't try to put two things in these slots which are both from the same space they have to be one from tangent space and the other from cotangent space so one vector field and the other a differential uh, or rather a one form now uh, all this was fine for objects based at a point because i told you that tpm is the tangent space at a point and t star p is the cotangent space at the same point so again remember that that point is important we can only talk about these as vector spaces at a point but now i can just as we extended vectors to vector fields and in fact so much so that i often confuse my words vectors uh, at a point to vector fields and it was very simple in coordinates all i did was to say that a i del by del x i goes to a i of x del by del x i similarly we can extend one form at a point uh, omega i d x i and we can allow these components to be functions all over the manifold okay now this thing was called a one form this one is called a differential one form or a differential form okay so it becomes a differential form if these things are c infinity functions on the manifold in any coordinate system rather than just being a set of components at a in a particular um, in, in that coordinate system at a particular point okay so try to keep these notations uh, distinct so here is a vector here is a vector field here is a one form and here is a differential one form it all depends whether i have the x dependence or i don't the moment i have x dependence now uh, it becomes a little tricky to combine them surely i can add them that's not a problem but i shouldn't think of adding ai at one x and ai at another x that makes no sense because they lie in completely different vector spaces okay good i'm a little scared to open the chat because there are 16 questions i'm hopeful that they cancel each other out somebody has answered them uh yeah
Yeah, Mohammed Hassan, no, uh, there's nothing like Lie brackets of basis vectors should be zero, not at all. Um, if we, I mean, we could have Lie brackets that are non zero or zero. It's, uh, it, dep yeah, it, no, it has, it, I don't think it, well, you, I think you're thinking of the fact that del by del xi is a basis. Uh, and therefore, the and del by del xi commutes with del by del xj, but it may not be true in general. I don't think it has to be true in general. Yeah. Uh, Jovi has said x subscript f comma g is x subscript f x subscript g. I'm not sure what that exactly means. Uh, oh, that was about Poisson brackets. Let's not go there. Is E star upper I unique for a given EI? Yes, it's defined by that. And a vector space cannot have two independent vectors uh, which have the same inner product. So in that sense, it's unique. It's, a, it's an abstract definition. Yeah. The inner, uh, Ashwath is asking, does the inner product between two vectors always have to be a number? So already you and some of the later people have jumped to the idea that we have an inner product between vectors. We don't have any such thing. We have an inner product between vector and dual vector only. Hmm. And you'll have to actually wait till the next lecture for there to be any kind of inner product in the space. And the lesson we learn here, which is a very, very deep lesson, is that the use of vector space and dual vector space does not invoke any metric. But the use of taking inner products between vectors in the same space does involve having a metric. Okay, So we are doing today what we can do without a metric. There's no metric defined. And everything that I've defined here is well defined mathematically, rigorously in principle. And you can look it up in Singer and Thorpe's book without any metric being induced in, introduced on the manifold. Hmm. Inner product is just a definition or does it involve some intermediate steps? No, it's just a definition. Can we understand inner product as generalization of dot products? No, because dot products are between vectors in the same space. And this particular inner product is between vectors in a space and the dual space. Uh, is the definition of F star the generalization of adjoint operators? Well, um, yeah, maybe it's related, but you know, for that we have to have operators in the first place. I, yeah, I mean, it might be, probably it, it is. Okay. Uh, can I give some illustration? We'll give a lot of illustrations. Just be patient. Is the basis even for TPM just notation or is it actually a derivative? So two things, the basis for TPM calling it del by del X, it's an abstract notation, but if you want to consider the action of vectors on functions, then it acts as a derivative. You have to distinguish two things in your mind. Okay, You could have given just the name EI to d by dxi, and all properties involving d by dxi are fine until I start acting on functions. Once I start acting on functions, then I have to tell you how my vectors EI act on functions, and now they are going to act as df by dxi. That's very important. And even then, I don't have to specify that because mathematicians instead say that x on fg is equal to x on f times g plus f times x on g. Now, you will say yes, yes, but everyone knows that that is distributive law for derivatives. So what you're defining by that is a derivative. But mathematician will say, yeah, that may be so, but x on fg equals x on f times g plus f times x on g doesn't invoke any coordinate system. And you physicists want to do this in a coordinate system. Hmm. So you have to realize that both del by del xi and dxi are abstract as well as they define a particular action. We'll see that dxi also has this interpretation as a differential, as an dif infinitesimal uh, length unit. It does have that interpretation too, but in a coordinate system. But in the abstract sense, it's just representing the basis of an abstract vector space. Cotangent is the same as one form. The space is called cotangent space, and the elements of it are called one forms. Just like the original space was called tangent space and the elements of it were called vectors. Hmm? So tangent and cotangent are the name of the space. Now, of course, we can use tangent vector to mean a vector which belongs to the tangent space. You can also use cotangent vector, but that's not used commonly because although cotangent space is a vector space, 
we all we reserve the word vector for vector fields so therefore we have to have a new word for the elements of cotangent space although abstractly they are also vector fields of a kind because they are fields and they belong in a vector space but we call them forms differential forms yeah are these coordinates always on the tangent and cotangent vector spaces or can they be charts on the manifold no 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 they are charts on the manifold they are not defined on the tangent and cotangent vector spaces okay they are first of all defined as charts on the manifold you, if you remember please go back to last lecture i introduced vectors by saying how they act on functions okay but now how do i describe a function on a manifold to so go back to the previous lecture to that when we introduced a differentiable manifold the function which takes an abstract point on the manifold to real numbers say is is understood or different and differentiated by first finding a coordinate chart then instead of using the function from the manifold we use the function from the chart and since the manifold a part of the manifold goes to the to the part of uh, euclidean space using a homeomorphism it's equivalent uh, in some sense i can always take any function on the manifold and make a function on uh, a subset of euclidean space okay so uh, coordinates are always associated to charts they're not introduced to talk about tangent and cotangent spaces okay they are already there it's assumed that they are already there a chart an atlas which defines a manifold gives me a whole collection of coordinate systems at least one for every region of the manifold maybe many yeah is one form just a way of saying vector expressed in cotangent space um, yes and no uh, the cotangent space is isomorphic as a space to the tangent space okay but when we start to think about these differential one forms the entire structure of it uh, will be quite different from that which comes from vector field there are different natural structures on them only as vector spaces they are isomorphic but you should keep them as distinct in your mind could i provide an example of vector field in physics sense and its corresponding dual vector yeah again please just wait a little bit um no oh. yeah yeah aryadeep uh, i mentioned in the first lecture maybe you missed it that a differentiable manifold is locally euclidean uh, oh so first of all locally euclidean has nothing to do with a metric hmm? uh, since i don't have a metric euclidean space is simply the direct product of real lines hmm. from this if i take minkowski space and forget about the metric it's the same space as euclidean space okay minkowski space is rn euclidean space is rn the problem is it, physicists say commonly rn they mean euclidean space with a metric on it with the euclidean metric and when they want to say minkowski space they say rn minus 1 comma 1 but rn minus 1 comma 1 as a differentiable manifold is rn no difference okay it's only the metric which makes the difference and there isn't any metric now so there's no difference so right now whatever we are saying is true of a differentiable manifold and there's no meaning to asking whether a differentiable manifold is locally minkowski okay because minkowski is a metric and without a metric there's no meaning of minkowski now in the next lecture we'll talk of riemannian manifolds and that time we'll make manifolds which are locally riemannian which means euclidean with a metric okay and now we can be pseudo riemannian or riemannian pseudo riemannian is possibly minkowski signature and riemannian is the euclidean signature i'm sorry these terms are all mixed up because in physics we assume many things in one word we assume many things okay we say euclidean continuation of field theory in that we are actually continuing the metric so it was always euclidean nothing was wrong with the space as a differentiable manifold we never changed it we only changed the metric so keep that in mind yeah what does cotangent space yeah yeah please please wait a little bit uh yeah uh yes that was a correct answer the difference doesn't occur till you define metric do you encourage discourage us from discussing among ourselves no no uh, most welcome no no it doesn't bother me doesn't bother me private messaging has been disabled i see no no that's fine i i'll just skip over it can we physically think of tangent space as locally flat spaces on the manifold but then will those tangent spaces have their own coordinates no 
uh, no, they don't have their own coordinates and they are not on the manifold. This is something very important. Okay, let's ask what is the intuition of a tangent? It's a line, it's a straight line which touches a curve. Okay, so for an infinitesimal distance, the points on the straight line are also points on the curve. The moment you get more than infinitesimal, the straight line goes its own way and the curve goes its own way. So these are two different spaces. Okay, in fact, as you'll see, you won't see probably because we're not going to get there, but the tangent bundle is the direct product of the tangent space and the base space, which is the manifold itself. So for a for a three-dimensional manifold, the tangent bundle is six-dimensional. It's a three-dimensional tangent space living over a three-dimensional manifold. They're independent in a sense, except that the, inter the definition of tangent space allows us to think that it is sort of touching the manifold at a point. But that really doesn't have a meaning in general because the manifold doesn't have any outside in general. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Great questions as always. And let me go on. Okay, good. People want some physics to happen and it will happen very soon. Uh, the, actually, most of the things I wanted to do are done. And now we can turn very soon to physics examples. But first, let's uh, have a few more definitions. Okay, so we defined a basis of one forms. Uh, now, if you remember, we had defined that uh, gradient del by del xi in some coordinate system. And then we gave an example which was uh, obtained by transporting a function along a curve. Then we found that it's transported by dxi by dt times del by del xi. So similarly, there are nice examples of differential forms. So important example of a differential form of a differential one form is the following. Supposing I have a function f from the manifold to R, then consider the one form del f by del xi dxi. This is certainly a one form because uh, this one is some set of components. I said a generic one form has some omega i with a lower index i which transform in a certain way. Well, del f by del xi transforms in exactly that way. You can check. So this is a valid one form where del f by del xi varies all over the manifold in a smooth continuous differentiable way and dxi is the basis. Now this we define to be d of f and we say that we've defined a new operator d called the exterior derivative. So the exterior derivative of a function on a manifold is the one form. So the exterior, so exterior derivative maps a function uh, to df. This is a function from m to r. And this is a differential one form. OK, now again, it's cute because d of f, if f is a function of x, then as physicists, uh, we would uh, working in coordinates, we would say that df is an infinitesimal unit of distance in f. And by chain rule, since f depends on x, it's given by this formula, df by dxi, dxi. But again, uh, that is true. And in fact, uh, we'll see that this formalism applies to Maxwell's equations, which is what we'll do uh, before the end of this lecture. Uh, but this is to be considered in a slightly more abstract sense that f is mapped to this differential form. D is a map from F to this differential form. Now there's a very nice relation. You might think that this looks, this also is ending up differentiating a function. You see that here we're differentiating the function, but vector field X also involves differentiation of a function. So are these things really different? Well, actually they are different, but there's a relation and the relation is very nice. If I have a vector field X, and I differentiate a function, then I get a new function um, x on f, okay? So that I've already explained. On the other hand, if I take a one form df, I can take its inner product with x because the one form is in the cotangent space and x is in the tangent space. So I can take its inner product and this inner product for every function f gives me a real number. 
okay so it's also a function uh it it also maps functions uh so how, how to say it also yeah so it's also a function okay so this is a function and this is a function and it's actually true that they are equal okay so here the vector field acting on a function gives me a new function that we've seen and here the vector field dotted using the inner product with its uh with a one form on the dual side which is the exterior derivative of that function okay these two inner products are the same and uh, proving it is completely trivial in any coordinate system so if x is equal to a i del by del x i then this is a i del f by del x i this on the other hand is the inner product of del f by del x i d x i comma a j del by del x j and in this inner product this this and this give me delta i j and at the end i get del f by del x i a i same thing okay so the action of a vector field on a function is the same as the function defined by dotting x with d of the function exterior derivative of the function it's a very beautiful relation okay so i know what you're thinking this is all very abstract we'd like to see applications i i promise that's coming but what i want to emphasize is that although vector fields and uh, dual their dual differential forms uh seem to be in one to one correspondence through this dual pairing the natural way to think about the action on functions is quite different okay a vector field acts on functions a differential form doesn't act on functions on the contrary from a function i can make a differential form by taking its d of course i'll get a very special uh differential form by taking d of f not all differential forms are of the form df but this is an interesting one because it obeys the relation given here so we should get used to the fact that vectors and differential forms Uh, although they are dual to each other they sort of do their own thing in their own way and these structures are all natural because they come from the properties of a manifold where we basically try to transport points uh, and then make a vector space that is the vectors and then uh, call it the tangent space and then we just define the dual space as a mathematical dual okay so this was easy now the last thing to do before we give the examples is uh, can we have forms uh okay so maybe the better better motivation is can we act with the exterior derivative on a one form and so we saw that d acts on f and gives me df can d act on df and if so what should it give okay or more generally can it act on any one form omega remember df is a special class of one forms omega are general one forms what should it give so let's first start with omega omega as a general one form in components is omega i of x dx upper i okay so let's guess that d omega is equal to del by del xj omega i dxj dxi we'll just allow two two dx's is the tensor product it's very much like the tensor product of uh, of of gradients that we used to define uh, tensors in the product of uh, tangent spaces here we are trying the same trick in the dual of the tangent space okay Uh, and for notation uh, brevity of notation i'll call this del j omega i dx j cross sorry just cross dx i now immediately there's a problem and it's very easy to check and you've encountered it in physics uh, omega i transforms nicely in fact in physics language it transforms as a covariant vector vector with its index uh, down under change of coordinates but del j omega i does not 
you know this because omega picks up a del x by del y factor in front now if i further differentiate it once the derivative will go on omega that's fine but once the derivative will go on del x by del y that's not fine that means that there's no sense in which del j omega i behaves uh, transforms uh, in two copies of the cotangent space it just doesn't okay now i know what some of you are thinking yes he's trying to differentiate a vector everybody who's done gr knows that you can't differentiate a vector you have to take the covariant derivative but the covariant derivative requires an affine connection the affine connection requires a metric we don't have a metric okay technically you could have an affine connection without a metric but we don't have an affine connection either and we don't yet want to introduce it we want to do everything we could possibly do without introducing metric and associated structures so is there something we can do now a very nice answer is that uh if we anti symmetrize this differentiation then we do get something in t star p cross t star p so here the problem was uh, this does not so it's not in t star p cross I didn't define this cross product of tangent and cotangent spaces, but I told you what are tensors, and by using that uh, concept, you can define the product of tangent spaces to get tensors, and you can define the product of cotangent spaces. The product, the problem is that differentiating a something in T P star doesn't give me something in T P star times T P star. Okay, but if we anti-symmetrize, then it does. So let's see how that works. so the correct definition of d acting on omega equals omega i of x dx i is d j omega i minus d i omega j d n with a half dx i cross dx j okay this one works okay uh, and why does it work because when i transform uh, to different coordinates uh, this will pick up some unwanted factor which comes from a derivative of del x by del y but that derivative will be symmetric in two indices and when i subtract the reverse that unwanted term cancels okay and therefore the anti symmetric differentiation is very uh, is particularly nice because it's a it's a way that i can go from one forms to what i'll call two forms on a differentiable manifold with no metric okay and you may have recognized that this is nothing but the curl okay anti symmetrized derivative is the same as curl so the natural way to carry out differentiation of a one form on a manifold is to take its curl now in terms of notation uh, a better way to write this is to write it as del i omega okay i might have written the indices you yeah, know this was okay i think uh yeah so del i omega j dx i wedge dx j so this symbol is called wedge and in in latex it's slash wedge and the uh this is the same this is just notation for it because what we've done is that dx i wedge dx j is half dx i cross dx j minus dx j cross dx i so we've anti symmetrized the basis if i anti symmetrize the basis then anything which multiplies it is automatically anti symmetrized because the indices are being summed over so then i don't have to write this coefficient twice i can write del i omega j minus del j omega i with a half and i'll get the same thing because this wedge product is already anti symmetrized so the rule is that exterior derivative takes um for example omega i to 
del i omega j minus del j omega i up to some possible factor okay and in general gives anti symmetrized um i don't want to call them tensors because in technically they're not let's say objects in tp star cross tp star and we can repeat this process and get uh, uh, anti symmetrized objects in arbitrary products of tp star with itself up to n times okay so therefore the possible uh, things we can talk of and this is now the different the set of all differential forms so what we do is first of all the familiar ones are the one forms omega equals omega i of x dx i we'll also include ordinary functions in one forms we'll just call them zero forms it's convenient to just include them then we'll have two forms i i can just give some other name for it i don't know what to call it um maybe i should put a one here for one form then omega 2 will be a two form will be omega 2 ij dx i wedge dx j now the transformation of omega ij is clear because dx i and dx j transform under change of coordinates like an infinitesimal and this should be coordinate invariant therefore we know how this transform and now you can continue until you get omega n which is omega i1 up to i n dx i1 wedge up to dx i n where n is the dimension of the manifold now if n is the dimension of the manifold i can't possibly anti symmetrize more than n indices because the indices only have n values so here it stops okay and we call these zero forms one forms two forms etc okay so the 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 precise definition is that exterior once i have got this set of forms then exterior derivative is a map from any n form oh, sorry now i shouldn't use n let's call it p form to a p plus 1 form which is given by the following d takes omega uh to d omega where omega is omega i1 up to i n d x i1 wedge up to d x i n and d omega is del so the last different uh, the last index is introduced by uh, differentiating with respect to del x i n plus 1 of omega i1 up to i n and then putting d x i n plus 1 first and then wedging it with dx1 wedged up to dx in okay uh, the point here is we should decide where this dx is put at the beginning or at the end because there could be a sign difference because in general dx i wedge dx j is minus dx j wedge dx i so you might have seen this differential form and wedge product notation before but since i'm introducing it afresh i mean freshly here i want to emphasize that it's a notation in order to define a class of uh, of 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 we might call them loosely tensors in the physics language a tensorial generalization of one forms one forms are dual to vector fields so we want to make a multi index generalization of them and for that we introduce differential forms but we restrict our attention only to the anti symmetric ones because then uh, exterior derivative is defined and it plays a very important role so the exterior derivative creates a structure which is called cohomology which we'll discuss uh, if we get time okay so uh, this uh, is okay now um there are some basic properties of uh, forms uh, which i i'll leave you to look up in the book uh, and since i'm out of time and i don't want to miss the chance to give you an example uh, because i keep promising and not delivering on that let's do electrodynamics now the thing about physics is that um 
you can take a particular physical object to be either a vector field or a one form or a two form or a tensor. First of all, it, its number of indices will be dictated by physics. For example, vector potential in physics is a one index object, but you can take it as a vector field or you can take it as a one form. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, I don't know what uh, other thing we can uh, look at, but field strength tensor, if you have seen that, it's got two indices and it's anti-symmetric. Turns out it's very natural to think of it as a differential two form. Not so natural to think of it as being in the tensor product of vector fields. So it, it's to some extent up to you. Now, what we'll start with is the vector potential. Now here really I must be careful because this notation uh, is physics notation and uh, is a one form. Capital A equals A i of x dx i. You may have seen this with an index mu going over 0, 1, 2, 3, but right now you can just take i over all the dimensions of your manifold and there's no metric. Okay, and we're still able to do a few things without a metric. Okay. So here's a one form. Now I told you that one can take the exterior derivative of it. So if we take D on A, it takes it to D A, which is a two form. And by what I told you, it's del J A I D X J wedge D X I. And this is the same as half del J A I. So first of all, I, uh, I'll, I'll just smoothen this out by exchanging the indices i and j. So this is the same as del i a j dx i. So the first step was done by following my rule, which says differentiate and whatever thing you differentiate with respect to, put the d of that in the front, not at the back. Hmm? But that's the same as this, just by interchange of i and j. This is half del i a j minus del j a i dx i well dx j. That's because uh, this being anti-symmetric already anti-symmetrizes this effectively. So I can as well write this. This is half F i j dx i wedge dx j, where F i j is defined to be del i a j minus del j a i. Now we've made some progress in ordinary electrodynamics. We work on um, uh, Euclidean space. Uh, primarily uh, and with a metric, which is a Minkowski metric. And that's how we get physics, of course, without a Minkowski metric, you don't have any um, thing like time and time evolution, everything is space. But right now we are avoiding the metric and therefore our differentiable manifold being Rn is fine. But this set of formula shows you that nowhere we really needed it to be Rn. Okay, we can define a one form A on any manifold, and therefore we can define electromagnetism on any manifold, and it stands to reason it should be possible. After all, I could maybe localize my electric fields to some surface or some surface phenomena in physics, and then they would be defined on some lower dimensional manifold, which might be a torus, it might be a sphere, it might be anything, and this allows me to do that. Okay, now this is, uh, this is um, uh, F, now we have a very interesting uh, property of the exterior derivative. I might repeat it next time. Okay, what happens if I calculate df? So first of all, uh, yeah, I should introduce better notation. Uh, this and f is fij dxi wedge dxj with a half. So this introduces the field strength Two form, while this A was the vector potential one form. It's a contradiction in terms because it's not a vector in the sense of tangent space, but I'm just using this because this is what otherwise we don't have. You could call it electromagnetic potential one form. I think that would be a better term. EM potential one form, and this is the EM field strength two form. Very good. Okay. Now, these are natural constructions in uh, the dual in, in the cotangent space of a manifold. If I introduce a one form, I can talk about its D, which is a two form. But now I notice a very interesting thing. What is D of F? 
So the exterior derivative of f comes with a clear rule. So d of f by definition is equal to del k f i j d x k wedge d x i wedge d x j. And uh, is there any factor? I think there's no factor. This is it. Yeah. Okay. Now the interesting thing, and this uh, is now totally anti-symmetrized over three indices. But the interesting thing is that this is equal to zero. DF is just equal to zero. And this is an example of the fact that exterior derivative satisfies D squared equals zero. Now D squared equals zero looks like a crazy equation from physics point of view, because if something squares to zero, it should be zero, but D is not like that. It's a derivative on forms with anti-symmetrization. So it can happen that if I take the curl and then I take the curl of that again, I get zero. In fact, curl of a curl in properly defined in this sense is actually zero. Why do I say that? Well, all you have to do is to plug in over here that this is del k del i a j minus del k del, okay, uh, del j a i. Okay, that's what this thing is. Now look at this, k and i, del k del i, the order of them commutes, but there's a dx k and a dx i sitting here, which anti-symmetrizes in i and j. So therefore this term goes away. Here we have del k del j, again, the order of derivatives commutes, but it's multiplied by a dx k dx j, which anti-symmetrizes it, so that's zero. So df is zero, okay. Now, all this didn't involve any physics. I just said that if I have a one form and I take its D, I get a two form. In general, since I took an arbitrary one form, the two form is just a two form. But if I take D of that, I necessarily get zero. Yes. Uh, somebody has decided to share their conversation with us. Okay. Anyway, good. Now let's try to associate this to things in physics. So we define, so now what I'm going to do is without any apology, introduce the I equals zero, one, two, three. I'll be boring and repeat that zero is no other, has no other property distinct from one, two, and three because I don't have any metric, but I'll use zero because that's what we'll use when we eventually have a metric and zero will be time. Okay, so we'll just let it run over four values and I'll label those four values like this. And now I'll make the definitions that F0i are defined to be minus EI and FJK uh, times the three index epsilon symbol uh, like this is defined to be B upper I. Okay, now this epsilon symbol is a new thing. I haven't uh, assured you in any way that I can introduce it. And for the moment, I've gone back to flat space where we know what it is. It's the thing which is, you know, anti-symmetric in the values one, two, three. And this i, j, k now only, okay. So here, <coughs> I think I might have cheated a bit. Uh, now i, j, k are only in one, two, three to make contact with electromagnetism. And I'll call this E as the electric field and B as the magnetic field. And uh, what I've basically said is that if there's a one form gauge vector uh, electromagnetic potential, then um, the electric field is a particular set of components of the exterior derivative of A, which is F, and BI is the remaining components. If you see F had components, uh, it was a four by four matrix. So if I write it as a four by four matrix, it's anti-symmetric. So it's diagonal is zero. And here I have, for example, F01, F02, F03. So these three make up E up to a sign. And here I have F12, F13, F23, like that. And these three make up B. So these make up E and these make up B. That's what I've done here. Now let's see what is the consequence of the equation df equals zero, okay? If df equals zero, then uh, this is the same as saying that fij comma k plus 
cyclic permutations f j k i plus f k i j is equal to zero, and it's also f zero i j plus f i j zero plus f j zero i equals zero. I've just written d f. Uh, you might know this fact that anti-symmetrizing three index indices is the same as summing over their cyclic permutations. Okay, now. Uh, Now we can see that these are the following equations. The first equation, if I use this definition of B i, is del i B i equals zero, which in physics notation we write divergence of B is zero. That's this equation, um, and it's only one equation because i j k, since it's a summing over cyclic permutations, i j k have to be distinct. And there are only three values, so there's only one equation, though it looks like a set of many equations. Okay. On the other hand, this equation gives me del i e j. Now you have to work it out with the signs and all. Uh, minus e i is equal to minus epsilon i j k del b k by del t. And if you work this out more carefully. You basically get curl of E is minus d b by d t. I hope I didn't get the signs wrong. Uh, I think this should be a uh, plus, plus or minus, plus or minus. Uh, one of them. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so there, yeah, you have to work this out. But the important thing is that two of Maxwell's equations are d f equals zero. They are embodied in one single equation, saying that the exterior derivative of a two-form vanishes. As simple as that. Now, for the other two of Maxwell's equations, if you know, if you remember your Maxwell's equations better than I do. Two of them don't have any source in them, and one of them has a charge density, and one has a current. Okay, the del dot e uh, has a charge, and the curl of b has a current, and neither of those, I think this was, yeah, uh, and neither of those is is here. We haven't found those. Well, it turns out the other two only make sense with a metric. And so I'll do it when we introduce Riemannian manifolds. But we learn something. We learn that these two equations are uh, actually a well. These two, uh, what are the two equations? This and this are a consequence of saying that there's a vector potential from which you can derive the electric and magnetic fields as the curl. Because you can derive electric and magnetic fields as curl of a vector potential, the uh, Exterior derivative of that must be zero because d of d is zero, and that gives me two equations which have non-trivial consequence in physics, and they are Maxwell equations. So they are nothing but, from the mathematical point of view, nothing but the statement that f is the exterior derivative of a. Okay, if f had been the basic variable of electromagnetism, we won't have got this conclusion because f would have been any differential two form. But because a is the basic variable and f is d of a, therefore we have these equations. Okay, so this puts in a mathematical setting two out of four equations. It explains in a way why they don't have any source because they are a statement of mathematical property of the field strength, not any physics. In some sense, there is no physics in this. Okay, in some sense, I mean there is a physics because it tells you that, for example, magnetic lines of force cannot terminate anywhere. But that's built into the study of uh, of vectors and differential forms in mathematics. These are all come from the fact that these things are C infinity. Okay, so I'll stop here, and we'll come probably revisit. Uh, we'll probably revisit um, electromagnetism a few more times in the next couple of lectures. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Would df comma x be an abuse of notation? No, 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 no. Uh, 
uh, we are putting element yeah it is the elements of the respective vector spaces sorry uh, achal vinod df comma x is no abuse of notation we are allowed to put a uh, element of tangent space in the second slot and cotangent space in the first slot x is an element of the tangent space because it's a vector field and df is an element of cotangent space because it's a differential form no abuse of notation at all we have exactly put them in the slot where they are allowed to be put hmm? please be very clear about that yes well the point is it's not so much about the point p i mean df comma x makes sense even for uh, you know point wise even if df is a function on is a is a is a one form differential one form and x is a vector field df comma x in a product is taking is taking place point wise and at every tp you have this inner product okay all you should not do is combine things from different tangent spaces at different points but at every point p you can take the inner product therefore you have the inner product not just between one forms and vectors but between differential one forms and vector fields so it's still well defined so we are differential forms are we translating in terms of dimensions i didn't quite understand that yeah dhruv you are right we need the hodge star operator to write the remaining maxwell equations that's why i haven't written them i'll explain that next time uh yeah no uh, so ritwik uh, actually if df is zero f is locally always da now this is a this is a yeah we'll come to that subtlety right now i'm just considering very simple cases so there can be manifolds where so we have to okay so let me uh, let me come to that next time the precise statement in electrodynamics is not that f is curl or is d of a but that f is always locally d of some a it's a very subtle situation and it brings in gauge invariance and we'll talk about this next time yeah when we anti symmetrize components of form instead of basis shouldn't the wedge product be replaced by a tensor product it can be but doesn't have to be if i if i have the components anti symmetric then the thing multiplying it can be tensor product or wedge product doesn't matter at all because there i can go back and forth between them likewise if the if i'm using the wedge product then the coefficient function can be either written anti symmetrized or not anti symmetrized it doesn't matter the basic point is when something is contracted with an anti symmetric thing then it gets anti symmetrized so writing both as anti symmetrized is not a problem okay is basically like if i was taking product of matrices a i j b i j for two matrices and if they were anti symmetric then i could write this as half aij minus aji bij okay if a and b are both anti symmetric and i can also write it as a quarter aij minus aji bij minus bji and i can also write it as half aij bij minus bji all are correct okay only thing when i anti symmetrize i must put the half yeah where did t come from sorry zero yeah zero as index but i did make that comment that you see when i translate mathematics to physics then i need to have some motivation to do that right so i could have you know picked one out of the four components and defined electric field with respect to that and magnetic field with respect to the other three so i just labeled them 0 1 2 3 and my point was since there's no metric uh Zero isn't distinguished from the others. It's just a it's a label. Instead of one, two, three, four, I can use zero, one, two, three. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So only two of the four Maxwell equations are free. The other two are not free, and we'll come to them. We'll, we'll discuss them next time. I just want. I'm I'm way over time today, and I'm really sorry about that. But I have finished answering the questions. So I think I should stop here.